He's a Chief Magistrate 1, Principal District Judge 1, Director of Planning, Research and Statistics, and Head of Toro Magisterial District, District, concerned about how law affects women and children at the federal and state levels. She's just the person you want to talk to. In addition to her work advocating on matters at the Bauchi State High Court, she also has interest in how women and children issues are addressed. She's an associate member of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Counselors. She is an associate member of the Conflict Management and Leadership Training Institute of Canada. She was bench member, judge, International Criminal Court, MOT, Court Competition, the Netherlands, 2018 and 2019, ha has received multiple awards from the Bauchi State branch of the Nigerian Bar Association. It is no secret that Chief Magistrate Shafao Ladan Yusuf has been one of the first women to break the glass ceiling and hold the top leadership position in the judiciary system in Bauchi State. Join me in welcoming Shafao Ladan Yusuf to today's show. Program. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're it's welcome. a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for taking time out to be with us, Hajia. Your journey is such an inspiration um what prompted you to always want to be you know to becoming a judge you know um uh, i mean i thank you for this your question if i will be truthful it wasn't really my ambition or interest to be on the bench oh. but i had always wanted to be a lawyer since from uh, primary school when i used to watch um remember a program a british program the Crown Court. So being on the bench, is uh, it kind of came as an afterthought. It wasn't really like my ambition from the very beginning, but then here we are. Yes. Okay, um, interesting. You know, something interesting about um, the judiciary is that every woman, female justice, is called a missus, whether she's married or not. No, mister. Mister. Yes. Oh, it's mister. It's mister. Female or male? Yes. Interesting. You know, um, in the legal profession, we don't have ladies. We don't have ladies. We don't have women. Everybody is a gentleman. Wow. Hence, the title. Mr. Esquire. Okay. You know, Esquire means gentleman. Yes. However, even though we don't have ladies, but we have gentlemen in skirts. <laughs> so we are gentlemen in, in skirts. skirts. Yes. Wow. Hence, that's, the title that's for everybody, Mr. Oh, okay. Yes. But so, uh, with the trend now, of this uh, gender equality and whatever, I think um, we are not really rigidly sticking to that. Yet. Okay, in Nigeria or all over the world? Well, it's Nigeria that I know, okay. so in Nigeria, okay. yes. Um, you've been in this profession for, you know, how many years now, Haji? Uh, I've been a lawyer for 21 years now. 21 years. And I've been on the bench, bench. of the magistracy for 15 years. 15 years, yes. so, uh, okay. Um, is everyone equal before the law? Yes. Everybody is equal before the law. That is what the Constitution says. That is what the UN Charter says. However, our situations may not be the same. Mm. We are all equal before the law, but then the equality, how is it attainable? You know, some people may be more equal than the others because of opportunities they have. And uh, some may not be as equal as others because of the situations they find themselves in. But everybody is equal before the law. So how did your background affect um, your desire to become a judge? Well, um, you know, as a woman and as a mother, as a big sister in my house, I'm the firstborn. Okay. So by default, you are a judge. Then coming with, um, looking at the situation I found myself at the time, my husband was in the army, and I needed some kind of stability at that material time that I decided. And um, I'm a person that likes challenge. Mm -hmm. So I saw it as kind of a challenge, and I felt it's something I could do. And um, I tried my luck, and I was elevated. Okay. Uh, most people say female judges most times judge differently. Is this true? Well, um, not only female judges, 
we all judge differently. If we were to sit on a judgment myself and you, naturally our perception would be different. Mm -hmm. But then what we are looking at is the ultimate destination. And that destination is justice. So we may judge differently, but at the end of the day, we arrive at justice. That is what matters. So what have been the challenges so far? You know. Um, well, the challenge is, as a woman, mm -hmm. as a female judge, as a, yeah. Well, uh, you know, like uh, I think the women fare better than the men on the bench. Mm. Mm, yes. Well, we have more. Well, we can say 50-50. Yeah, you could say like in the high court, we have uh, more men. Like in my state, we have like 20-80%. Um, wow. That is, uh, we just have two female judges, then we have men. But when you come down to the magistracy, where I belong, it's like 60-40. Oh. And even the staff in the high court is maybe 60-40. Or they are about the ratio between men and women. So what are the challenges? You see, like, um, if I were to be fair to the men, you know, they have a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And being of the, on the bench, the work is too much. But then there is no commensurate pay. The earning is not much. And then going by the code of conduct of the judiciary, there are a lot of things that you're not supposed to do. So the men, in addition to um, adjudicating, have to maybe supplement or augment whatever they are getting mm -hmm. by maybe farming and other things. But what of the female? We have more stability than the men. So the women fare better than the men on the bench. That is my belief. Okay. Um, have you ever lost sleep over a decision you uh, made in court? Made by who? By myself or by, by somebody? Not necessarily, because um, once you are fair and just, and then, um, you know, because of the oath we normally take at the beginning, that is on appointment, mm -hmm. you um, take an oath that you are going to be fair to everybody, and that you are not going to fear anybody and all that. So whatever you do, if you do it justly and with the fear of God, you shouldn't lose sleep. Mm. Yes, the law is there, it's just to apply it. Dispense it. Okay. So what case, which case would you say has been the most interesting case since, you know, you became a judge? Uh, it's normally matrimonial cases. I wouldn't want to delve mm -hmm. into it, you yeah. know. Um, but um, there are cases like that, matrimonial cases that you could see that the issues are not really serious like that. It's just a matter of ego. Okay. You understand, just for somebody to say I'm sorry and all that. And sometimes it's matrimonial issues, but they will come to court sometimes and create everybody, drama, yes, and create and drama. everybody will laugh and every <laughs> at the end of the day. Is there any particular case that had an impact on you? Well, yeah. Um, Till date? In my own court or in somebody's court? Anyway, maybe your court, you know. You know, I wouldn't want to delve into a, or tell you much um, about yeah. a particular case or that, but then there are many. There are many, and like I said, it's mostly matrimonial cases. Mm -hmm. That has made me to believe that what we say in Hausa, Sakani Mata de Miji. So you, <laughs> you don't try and uh, impose yourself between a husband and a wife and all that. So I have learned a lot of uh, things from. Would you do this kind of all over again if given a second chance? Yeah, I think so, yes. That is being on the bench and yes. all that, yes. Why? Yeah, because. Um, when you dispense justice, you get a sense of uh, satisfaction and um, there is a kind of closure. You feel as, um, well, thank God I've done this. If I were not there, I would not be able to do it and all that. So if you were not a judge, if you didn't go into the law profession, mm -hmm. what would you have been? A teacher. Mm. Yes. I've always wanted to be a teacher, aside from... Maybe a, a law teacher or just a teacher, teaching anything. I love to teach. Okay. I've been a teacher. Even now, if I have, or if I get the opportunity to teach, I will teach. Okay. Yes. Any of your children trying to tow your path? Yeah. Oh. Uh, presently, 
my third child, that is my first daughter, is in 200 level reading law. Okay. And my last one also wants to read law. Wow. That is the daughters, but the sons. <laughs> they, want to, the they, don't want to, they want to go somewhere yeah. different. So what does being a woman in the judiciary system in Nigeria mean to you? It's a validation that whatever a man can do, a woman can also do. I wouldn't say a woman can do better. You know, I'm not a feminist like that, mm -hmm. even though I am an advocate of equality between the two. So whatever a man can do, a woman can also do. She can do equally good. Mm. It's a validation that, yes, uh, my decision or my resolution at that time to read law was the correct one. Yes. You know, back then, where, where girls seemed to be reading law, like yourself, you know, like now we have a lot of them mm. going into the law profession. But back then, it must been, have been a long time where women also interested in reading law then. Not a lot of women because uh, there is this misconception that law is difficult. Isn't it? It's not. It's just like every endeavor. The way you take it, that is how you meet it. If you believe it's hard, certainly it will be hard. But if you believe it's just one of those things and I must do it, you do it. So to me, I would say law is not hard. It's very interesting. Do we have, yeah, there are a number of um, female judges, northern female judges mm. and all that, but do we have that number like mm. we have in other parts of the country? Uh, first of all, let me make a clarification. In order for myself and you not to be liable, you for misrepresentation and myself <laughs> for impersonation. When you use the word judge, in Nigeria it connotes the judge of the superior court. Oh, okay. That is high court. Magistrate, okay. <laughs> no, not magistrate. Um, high court. The magistrate where I belong, belongs to the lower courts. We are called inferior courts, lower courts, magistrate court, district courts. It's only when you, you, like in my state, you are a judge when you are sitting on civil cases as a district court judge. Well, ordinarily, we call ourselves magistrates. Okay. Okay. Even though I've been striving for over 10 years to be on the high bench, but then the clarification is apt. Yeah. So I am a judge of the lower courts. And um, what was that your question? I said northern women. Okay. Do we, how do we encourage them basically to go into the law profession? Well, uh, I think um, it's not yet Uhuru, but we are on course. Northern women are really going into law profession and on the bench because of the stability, like I said. It's not the same with uh, practicing. That is um, at work case where you go to Codley and all that. You run here, run Helter Skelter and everything. This one. You are just, you just, is um, a sedentary or more stable occupation. You understand? Mm -hmm. Well, let's say when you are in the stage of your fecundity, you are giving birth and all that, you need a st kind of stability. Yeah. So the bench is very, very stable. So a lot of women, especially northern women, are really going into it. Now. Okay, what are the biggest changes you think we can, um, we need? in the judicial system in the country? You, you know, when you say judicial system, it comprises of, uh, like in my state, the Sharia Court of Appeal and then the High Court. So like for the High Court, I think everything is on course. Especially when you look at um, women issues, you understand? We have, um, like I said, like in the magistracy, we have 60, 40 that is the judges, then the staff, almost the same thing and everything. Now coming to Sharia Court of Appeal, I have spoken in a lot of fora, and the present Grand Guardian and other cadres they have agreed with me that there is need to overhaul that system. You know, like uh, Sharia Court of Appeal dispenses justice mm -hmm. or administers justice in Islamic personal law. That is issue of inheritance, uh, children custody and all that. So a situation whereby a court that sits on those kind of issues yeah. is manned primarily from the top to the bottom by men. 
Oh, you know, women will never ever be confident or comfortable. And you know how our women are. Some of us, if we see a place that uh, is being uh, populated by a lot of men, to even enter that place is a problem. Yeah. So what of where you go to your court and your case is called, maybe it's a matrimonial issue that has to do with matrimonial issues, I mean then, and then the judge is a man, mm. the registrar is a man, the court registry are all men, the lawyers there perhaps are all men, Maybe the woman is just herself, then you call her to come and start narrating certain things. Naturally, substantial justice cannot be obtained in that kind of situation. So there is need to overhaul that system because at the moment, like Sharia Court of Appeal in Bauchi is being manned or populated by like 90, 95% men. So oh. I believe changes should be made in that. And like I said, we thank God the present Grand Cardi and a lot of the Cardis agree that there is need for that. Yes. Okay, we'll be taking a short break. Uh, when we get back, um, Barista Shefa will be talking about um, reforms she hopes to see. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Um, looking forward, what is the most important reform you you hope might be made in the judicial, you know, uh, Like I said, you know, um, Nigeria is a signatory to a lot of uh, treaties. treaties, conventions, accords, and all that. There is one that I hold very dear. That is the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 which talks about um, involvement of women in peace, um, peace, sec peace and security, okay. you understand? So, um, and when we talk of uh, security, if there is no substantial justice, or more than half of the population cannot access justice, you know, there wouldn't be any peace. So I think, like I keep saying, the justice system, not judicial system, now the justice system needs to be overhauled so that you involve women in every aspect from arrest, prosecution, um, adjudication, and uh, where the need arises, maybe um, incarceration in prison or whatever, or correction. You know, we are using correction. correction <laughs> yes. <laughs> so at least, so that, like I keep saying, like the example I gave you with the Sharia Court of uh, Appeal, mm -hmm. what is happening now is that uh, from the very beginning, let's say you have a matter, and you go and report at the police station. A lot of the times, you find only men. The women may be there, but they are doing a service. What do you call it? Taking tea and whatever to August offices and everything. So the one that you go and speak to may be a man. The prosecutor assigned to your case may be a man. You go to the court. You know that one is, um, the police now is part of the um, executive arm of government. Then you now go to, Maybe there will be need to now go again to the Attorney General's chamber yeah. for advice and whatever. You go, maybe the lawyer writing advice and everything is a man. No. Let's say it's a woman now, an indigent woman coming from the village. Then yeah. from there you now go to the court. The prosecutor is a man, or the lawyer they give you from the ministry is a man. The judge is a man. And at the end of the day, if you are the one going to prison or whatever, it is men there and everything. So at the end of the day, we really need to adhere to this uh, resolution of the United Nations because we are a signatory. We even have national action plan, even state action plan okay. and everything. But we just sign those laws and just dump them. And even our constitution is not helping matters because the constitution says you should respect those treaties and whatever. But then in section 19, it's saying unless and until those treaties and whatever you have signed are now being legislated upon by the National House of Assembly and made into an act of the National Assembly, mm -hmm. then for states to adopt and before it can be implemented. 
So we'll just go and sign and sign beautiful laws outside, bring them. At the end of the day, they will just be gathering dust. Nothing is going to happen. So I think something needs to be done. So like uh, the justice system, the whole justice system need to be overhauled. And in line with the resolution of the Security Council of the United Nations, we need to involve women everywhere so that uh, you go to court. If the judge is not a woman, at least the registrar is not a woman. Go to the police station, the same thing. Go to the Ministry of Justice, the same thing. At least substantial justice will be achieved. If we Speaking do that. about substantial justice, um, what do you feel about female prisoners? Because we have a lot of female prisoners in prisons who don't have the right, are not given the opportunity to the right access to justice. Mm -hmm. So they are just there. Nobody, you, you have forgotten. No, you I, know. So, I tend to disagree with you in that aspect. Okay. Because like my state, the chief judge is a woman. Mm -hmm. And she always goes, we normally follow her for prison visits. So I discovered that the in, female inmates are faring better than the men. Wow. Yes. Okay. Their that's own in Bauchis, that's in of course, their accommodation is cleaner, more spacious, and they are taking better care of than the men. Mm. Yes. Wow. And you know, um, that is the beauty of having a female chief judge. You understand? Mm -hmm. She goes and she makes sure she checks all these things and see the condition of the every inmate, but then she takes special care of the female so that she will see whether they are being catered for properly. Okay. So in my state, I don't know of other states, female inmates are doing very good. Okay, when you, when you, uh, so let's go, but let me rephrase the question. What do you think can be done to um, the concrete steps to be taken to better the access to justice for female prisoners? Female prisoners, <laughs> like I have said, the ones in or my state women's have access to, to justice. You know, to justice. Yes. Um, you Let's know, forget like, the prison, Just female access to yes, justice. Yes, the whole female one. Yes. So like I said, uh, we need to involve a lot of women, substantial number of women in the uh, justice system. Mm. So that at least anywhere you come, you will find women. I, as women, we think by default as women. You know, men think by default as men. Mm -hmm. So when it is a woman that you meet, men looking at your face, men looking at your face, she will know the kind of problem. Due to our peculiarities, she will know the kind of problem or the kind of issues that you are having. But when it is a man and you decide to be coy or sh uh, shy or something, you just shout. What is this one doing and everything? But if it is a woman, she will know. You know, we are mothers. And we are also multitasking. Yeah. So a woman is, uh, by default, a psychologist, a counselor, and everything. So by looking at a woman, she will know how to go about even getting her to open up and see what is wrong with her. So honestly, I believe, I think we need to involve a lot of substantial number of women in the justice system. So, so, so um, taking it from there, since you joined the, the bench, yes. okay, has things, how has things progressed for women, both in and out? Uh, you know, we can't always um, be blaming external forces for our plight. Mm -hmm. We also are to blame. Mm. Um, naturally, I don't know whether it's stereotype, a lot of women have uh, apathy for whatever they are doing. What I discovered, especially in the judiciary, in the judiciary, women are given more opportunities than men. But then we tend to shy away. Some fear that they don't want to be, and they don't want people to assume that they are ambitious. Forgetting that uh, ambition is just planning. Mm -hmm. He who fails to plan, is That's planning okay. to fail. So they will be scared, they will say, I'm too ambitious, I'm this, I'm that. And you have to be ambitious. So there is apathy mm. in a lot, of, a, a lot of the time. This I don't care attitude. Let me give you an example with um, the judiciary. Like I said, we have like 60, 40. That is the population of the male and female. You will discover that um, in the course of uh, every day, doing your job every day. Maybe in my court, I have, uh, let's say, 40 to 50 staff. 
maybe like 20 women or 15 or so. At the end of the day, you may find that it's just two or three that will be coming to work every day. They will refuse to come to work because they don't care. The only time they care is when promotion is or needed. Salaries. Yes. Or salaries. Or when they refuse to pay, or when there is delay in payment, then you see everybody, you'll be like, where are these ones coming from? Or when there is, a, is this service come, they call it, <laughs> coming to take attendance and everything. So women tend to be apathetic to a lot of things. We want higher pay, we want to be given big boost, but we don't want to give our own commensurate contribution. Yes. We don't want to contribute our own quota. Not all of us, but a lot of us, that's the problem. You may see in an office, maybe the registrar is supposed to be a woman, but you will never see her. She okay. will allow the men, maybe of level 7, when she's in 12 or 13, coming to work every time. It's only when there is uh, something to be shared or something, then you will see the woman. Okay, Haja, if, if you were to give an advice to someone who wishes to tow your line, someone younger, yes, 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 female, yes. northern female, what yes. advice? One part um, particular advice. Yeah, I would tell her that uh, she should strive. She should be diligent. The Nigerians, we are also known as resilient, and she has to work hard. She should trust in her ability. That as a woman who, like me, that I'm on the magistrates, you know, magistrates is just a stepping stone. She should know that the sky is her limit. Uh, last question, Hadja. What are your retirement plans? Last question, we're wrapping this, okay. this up. Um, like I told you, I'm on the magistracy at the moment. And like I said, magistracy is just a stepping stone. I have three um, scenarios or three plans, plan A, B, C. The first one is, um, and I've given my time, myself time limit or time frame within which to actualize uh -huh. these plans. Plan A is uh, maybe in the next one year, where I'll be 20 years working for the uh, Bauchi State Government, is to be on the bench of the High Court. You know, as human beings, mm. we say man proposes, God disposes. God disposes, God willing. But if I am not able to do that, it means that might not be my calling. Plan B is to retire early, gather small money, <laughs> open my own chamber, contribute my quota. If I don't do that, plan C is to retire early and join politics. Okay. Yes. There is no doubt that women are competent to lead, not because they are women, but because they are qualified. They have the necessary skills and experience to lead in the judiciary. Women are on par with their male counterparts and therefore must be provided with equal opportunities. Thank you, Barisa Shefautu, for joining us on the program Thank today. Thank you, Adia Amina, for having me. It's always a pleasure talking with you. All right. Mm -hmm. Until next week, when we bring you another interesting guest, I remain your host, Amina Al-Hassan. Stay safe and remain blessed. <laughs>